Welcome to the Nurse Shark Academy Show, a Baxter Professional Services production. Welcome to the Nurse Shark Academy Show, where we're experts in nursing and experts in business. I'm Tina Baxter, your host of Nurse Shark Academy Show, highlights nurse business owners and others in the healthcare field who promote entrepreneurship. We interview nurse leaders and encourage them to tell their story. Today, we have our guest, Pat Iyer, who is a prolific author and legal nurse consultant business coach. Today's episode, how one nurse who sold her company made a fresh start as a business coach and author. Welcome to the show, Pat Iyer. Hello and welcome to the Nurse Shark Academy show. I'm Tina Baxter and I'm your host. And I wanna thank you for tuning in today. The Nurse Shark Academy show highlights nurse business owners and others in the healthcare field who promote entrepreneurship. We interview nurse leaders and encourage them to tell their story. Today's guest is Pat Iyer. Pat Iyer is well known in the legal nurse consulting field and in the nursing field. She's written several books and I'm very pleased to have her. Welcome to the show, Pat. Thank you so much, Tina. Now, tell me, tell me a little bit about your background, because I know you as the legal nurse consultant, business owner, author, and all of that, but let's let our listeners know the hard-hitting question, what made you become a nurse? When I was investigating careers, and there was never any question that I would go to college, when I was in high school, there were three or four career options for women. There were secretary, teacher, nurse, and librarian. And secretary didn't sound very exciting to me. Teaching sounded interesting. I did some library work as a volunteer in my high school years, and I knew that involved shelving books and putting cards in the card catalog. And I couldn't see that as a career. So nursing was the choice for me. I wanted to help people, and I thought that would be a good opportunity to be able to learn skills And even at that time in the 1960s, it was pretty clear that nurses were in demand and could get jobs very easily in comparison to some other professions. So so how did you start out um, in your nursing career? Where did you go to school and where did you train? Because it's always fascinating for our listeners to know the different ways to get into the field. Well, at the time that I got out of high school, the choices were to go to an associate degree program not too many of those, a diploma program, lots of those, or a four-year college program. I applied for a four-year college that accepted me uh, to get a degree in psychology, but part of me said, you know, that's not really what I want to do. And then the diploma program that I went to, Muhlenberg Hospital in Plainfield, New Jersey, said that they would give me a thousand dollar tuition for three years if you can believe being able to complete a three-year program for a thousand and they gave me a full scholarship so it literally cost me nothing to go to nursing school i then went on to university of pennsylvania and spent another three years they gave me a year's worth of credit for my diploma program although it was the last year that they did it And then they also gave me some scholarship money. So I came out of that educational program owing a little bit of money and then started working as a medical surgical nurse with those three years of diploma program and then three years of the bachelor's program. I then worked for five years as a staff nurse and went back and got a master's degree at University of Pennsylvania with a major in nursing minor in med surge, and I focused on diabetes and teaching patients about diabetes. And I came out of that program with a few more student loans to focus on repaying. So was that more like the clinical nurse specialist role, um, that master's program? It was not a clinical nurse specialist role. It was not a nurse practitioner role. It was a med surge uh, focus on that specialty. And again, the program was beginning to be phased out. 
there was a big demand for clinical nurse specialists and nurse practitioners and nurses wanted to go into one of those tracks. So I took all of the courses that would have qualified me to be a nurse practitioner, except that I didn't go through the prescriptive courses and therefore was not allowed to write scripts for medications. Okay. And so you worked as a diabetes educator? No, I worked as a staff nurse on med surge units for the five years in between my two degrees. But when I came out, I looked at what are the opportunities to use my master's degree. There were really a couple of choices. If I wanted to focus on education, I could go into a hospital and work in staff development, or I could go into the faculty role and teach students in a two-year or a four-year program, or even a three-year program. But what I found out, Tina, was, and there was already an entrepreneurial part of my personality, is that nurses who worked in those faculty positions at that time sometimes made less than the students that came out of the programs. And for their commitment, they were expected to write for publication, do research, maintain a clinical role, and teach. And that sounded like a whole lot of work for me, plus go on and get their doctorate. So I decided at that point, that was not for me. I wanted to be involved in teaching and applied for a job as a staff development director at a hospital, easy commuting distance from my house, and was hired by a woman, the vice president of nursing, who had a very strong commitment to the concept of bringing nurses with master's degrees into her hospital. She had clinical nurse specialists. I had a master. She was very dedicated to that concept. And that got me in the door. Well, you know, that that's kind of interesting because I know a lot of uh, nurses are wondering what to do. And that same thing is kind of still true in academia, um, that if you practice clinically, you tend to make more than you would if you were to teach, uh, which I think is really unfortunate. And mm -hmm. I think it's a sign of, you know, nursing has pr uh, traditionally been a um, profession that women have been in majority. And I think that kind of plays a little bit in the politics um, for being faculty. So, yeah, I understand um, those challenges. And so as, as a person who's really into that med surge, and you mentioned having that entrepreneurial spirit, how did that play out um, later on? When I was in graduate school, my husband decided that he wanted to start a business. He had been terminated from his position as national sales director because he was starting to develop ambitions that threatened the CEO of the company. So about a month into my master's program, he came home in the middle of the day and said, I've been fired. And that was pretty shocking to us because yeah. we had dedicated my life to being in graduate school under the assumption that he would be earning his paycheck and paying our bills. We had just been about to buy a piece of land on our street that was on sale for $25,000 and something held us back. And it turned out that $25,000 kept our household going until I graduated from my master's program. He bought a plant in an industrial city and started his own business. And I watched him struggle, Tina. I watched him work seven days a week. We had a young child at the time who barely knew his father. My husband was very entrepreneurial. And after three years of effort, he had to close that business. The list, some of our listeners may remember the interest rates in the 1980s. He was paying 25% a month in interest rates oh, wow. on the money that we borrowed. And we signed a personal guarantee, which for people who don't know what that means, it's, it's a pretty sinister thing. We borrowed a million dollars through a series of small business 
loans and minority small business loans. He's Indian. He qualified as a minority. And the personal guarantee said if you default on the loans, everything you own can disappear. Yeah. That's pretty sobering because he got to the point where he couldn't pay back the money that he borrowed with that 25% interest rate. And the business wasn't going all that well. So there was a man who came into our house and walked around and made a decision about whether the bank would be willing and interested in taking our house. My husband followed him around and said, see that crack in that wall? See that water stain? Um, see the uneven floor here? Trying to minimize the value of the house. Right. He was successful in negotiating his way out of having to declare bankruptcy, but we came that close and, you know, an inch away from losing everything while I was five months pregnant with our second son. It was the most vulnerable time in my life to realize that we could be out on the street and I could be doing baby care in a cardboard box on the street. And that was just a terrifying idea. So it was only because of my husband's entrepreneurial negotiation skills that we got out of that, that did not discourage me a few years later from starting my own business. But we never borrowed money again. I didn't borrow any money in order to start my business. I made sure that if there was anything I needed for my company, I wasn't going to sign a personal guarantee ever again. I think that's important for our, our listeners to know because one of the things that scares nurses from starting their own business is finances and how do we finance our business. And so um, I'm, I'm of the opinion is, as long as you can bootstrap it, keep your nine to five as long as you can until you're really ready to make that jump, you know, unless you got investors lined up, that may be the best way to go. And so knowing that that didn't scare you from being an entrepreneur, how did you get started in your business and what you started doing? When I finished my master's degree and got that job in the staff development, there were a couple of other nurses in my city who were also directors of staff development in their local hospitals. And all three of us were being told by our nursing administrations that they'd heard about this thing called nursing diagnosis. And they wanted us to teach our staff about it. We realized that if all three of us had the same mandate, we should get together and split the work. So we wrote a self-learning module and we used that module to teach the nurses in our three hospitals. And we thought it was pretty good. We thought we could go to a publisher and get it published. The first publisher said, nice self-learning module, but what we need is a textbook that we can sell to schools of nursing. We said, yeah, too much work. We'll go to another publisher. They'll accept it just the way it is. Second publisher said, nice self-learning module, but we need a textbook. People need that kind of material in schools of nursing. So the three of us got together and wrote our first book together, my first book ever, their first books ever. That was a significant piece of my authority when I decided I wanted to become an expert witness. And it was because of a seminar that I went to called Career Alternatives for Nurses taught by a nurse from California called Clarissa Russo. I would love to thank her if I knew how to find her today because she talked about uh, a variety of different roles. And one of the things that she discussed was legal nurse consulting, although it was not called that at that time. She, it was more medical legal consulting. And she explained that nurses were needed in the court system to review cases form opinions about the standard of care and testify. And I thought, well, that sounds kind of interesting. 
So I went back to the hospital. I talked to the risk manager who was an attorney. This was a one day seminar that I attended while I was working as a nursing quality assurance coordinator, having left my job in staff development about a year before. And he explained about how you find attorneys, approaching them through letters and offering your services. So I could put on my resume that I had co-authored this book. Little did I know that there are, and at that time, and still are a lot of cases involving medical surgical patients, falls, medication errors, pressure sores, treatment errors. So I was offering my services as a nurse with a master's with a publication on my resume that made me attractive to attorneys who were involved in these cases. I sent out 20 letters. I got my first case immediately, my second case a few weeks later, and eventually all of those 20 attorneys ended up using me at some point in the 20 years or so that I spent testifying as a medical surgical nursing expert witness. So let's let's take a pause here for a minute. And for those that are listening that aren't familiar with legal nurse consulting, kind of explain the role of an expert and what's required to be an expert witness. In the nursing world is responsible for forming an opinion on whether what happened to the patient was done as a result of a deviation from the standard of care or was what happened to the patient unrelated to the nursing care and the care was defensible. Each side needs an expert in order to be able to proceed. The attorneys are looking for people who are willing to be able to, willing and able to take a stand. It's not good enough in the legal system for me to say, well, I think that the nurses did everything right, but I'm not willing to go to court to testify. They need somebody who will raise his or her right hand and swear to tell the truth. Many cases settle. The vast in which the plaintiff attorney is asking for too much money and the case doesn't justify it, or the defense believes that that case is truly defensible. So therefore the nurse could work for either side and the balanced expert works for both plaintiff and defense attorneys in order to maintain credibility. And one of the ways that you also have to maintain your credibility is to still be actively practicing in that specialty or field of nursing. Yes, um, there are people who work full time as clinical nurses and do this on the side. There are people who have a part-time job. I worked in the PRN pool. I worked a few days a month for several years while I was testifying. That clinical role serves a couple of purposes. It increases the expert's credibility and it shows the jury that this person is not so far removed from the clinical role that they've forgotten what it's like or they're too idealistic. And secondly, a, a benefit that people don't often think about is that when you review cases as an expert, it carries over to your clinical role. You know, as an example, I worked on a case involving two men who had the same first name and last name who were in a hospital at the same time, separated by different nursing units. And it was at a time when, and some of your viewers may remember this, when we had metal plates that were called addressographs, yes. and we used them to stamp up the chart. Yes. So one of these guys was moved to a different room within the unit. They sent his addresso addressograph down to the admitting office to bring up a new plate, to make up a new plate. And the person who was looking at the records picked the wrong file and set up a plate that had the other man's age, physician, and address on it. So they started using this plate, and it turned out the men had two different blood types. 
and you could pretty much figure out where we're going with this. Yes. Our guy got blood that was the blood type for the other man in the hospital with the same first name and last name. When the blood came up to the unit, the nurses checked the blood at the nurse's station with the chart, which had been stamped up with the wrong plate, and that matched the blood. So they thought, okay, this is fine. What they didn't do was to go into the room and check the man's ID band at the bedside. Yeah. Missed that step. So they hung two units of blood. The man died of a transfusion reaction. And the case eventually went to court. There was a small settlement on the part of the nurses, and they uh, there was a little bit of money that was awarded for the family. One of the odd things about this case was that in the middle of the blood transfusion, this man's doctor came in to see him, and there were changes in vital signs. He was showing classic signs of a transfusion reaction. And the doctor looked at him and didn't make the diagnosis, left the room, went on his way. So the plaintiff attorney hired an expert witness to come into court to testify about how that doctor deviated from the standard of care by not diagnosing the transfusion reaction. Unbeknownst to the plaintiff attorney, the expert witness was an alcoholic. Oh. So when he was supposed to be on the plane to fly to the courtroom, he was in bed intoxicated and never showed. So the jury didn't hear any testimony about the doctor's responsibility, and they ended up finding the doctor not negligent. Mm. Now, how this relates to clinical care is that after I finished this, my role in this case, and I was working at surge staff nurse, nurses would come up to me holding blood bags with, in their hand and saying, Pat, would you check this blood bag with me? And I would say, yes, let's do it at the bedside and make sure that we check the patient's ID band. And they said, oh, that's not necessary. We can do it at the nurse's station. And I said, no, we can't. And here's why. And after they finished hearing the story, some of them were visibly backing away from me like, oh, that's horrifying. Well, yes, it yeah. is. Yeah. If, if you don't follow all the steps and you're not sure that that blood is intended for that patient, that can be the outcome. That's so important. It goes back to that teaching again with students that those five rights now, I think there's six or seven, and <laughs> they keep adding on, but it's important to do that. And I remember those uh, addresser graph stamps because I used to get the charts with those on there all the time. And um, you would always have to check the, the orders with the Cardex and make sure everything was right. and. I'm, I'm kind of glad we've gone to electronic medical records because the handwriting was horrible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. And so how did you then segue into um, opening up your practice and doing a lot more? Because it's, you know, um, over the years, you've written several books, you've done all these different things. And so you've had other people that work for you. So how did you get to that place where you got to expand? A couple years into me reviewing cases as a med surge expert, I got a phone call from a plaintiff attorney asking me to review an emergency department case. And I knew that was not in my skill set, never worked there, not the right person for him. But I had a friend who was a clinical specialist who worked with me in that hospital where I was in charge of staff development. And I decided to refer her to him. She got the case. You know those light bulb moments, Tina, when you sit back and you say, hmm, well, I just did him a favor for free. I just did her a favor for free. I wonder if there's a business providing expert witnesses other than myself. And it turned out there was a lucrative business by the time I sold my company in 2015, I started it in 1987. I had 200 people under contract to review cases for me, all expert witnesses, doctors, nurses, physical therapists, you know, a whole assortment of people. 
So that was what got my business to the point that it became a million dollar a year business in terms of annual sales was that I was billing for the services of the expert witnesses who I recruited, I trained them, I supervised them, I proofread their reports, I troubleshooted when they had issues. I was the interface between them and the attorney. And for them, many of them appreciated the fact that they could be walking down the hall in their job and they would get a phone call from me that would go something like this. Tina, I've got a nursing home case. It involves a patient who fell in, fell out of bed and fractured her spine, ended up paralyzed. The attorney who contacted me is representing the family. Are you interested in reviewing this case? I can tell you a little bit more about it. Here's the name of the facility. Do you have any conflict of interest? No, Pat. And then we're off and running. So they didn't have to do any work to get that case. It was a phone call that came out of the blue and they got a lot of support from me and help to develop their expert witness skills. So that's important to, to talk about because that's a win-win situation. And I think that in, um, in the legal nurse consulting world, sometimes um, novice legal nurse consultants don't understand how to maneuver themselves so that you benefit from getting the experience of working with someone who's already experienced, but you also um, help that person get what they need done. Um, so that's a win-win situation. And I actually say it's a win-win-win because the attorney gets what he, he or she needs. Your subcontractor, for lack of a better term, uh, that LNC gets the training that they need. And of course, as a business owner, you get that additional revenue um, without having to do all the work yourself, because it could be, be a lot if you have several trials going on or several cases that you're working at the same time. And that expands your reach. Absolutely. You're correct on all points, Tina. All right. So, um, just just as we're getting ready to uh, wrap up here, um, if you had one piece of advice for either a legal nurse consultant who's starting out or a business owner who's just starting out, we didn't even chance to talk about your books and all the books you've written, but what would your advice be? There are risks associated with starting a business. There are risks associated with being an employee, including that you're facility could merge with another one and you could become redundant or that your hospital could discontinue the services that your unit is providing. If you have an entrepreneurial spirit to you, then I would encourage you to not let the risks of being in business dissuade you, but to be very clear-minded about what you are embarking upon. Do as much research as possible. Make sure that there's a market for the services that you want to offer. And I'm thinking not necessarily of legal nurse consulting, but nurse entrepreneurs who want to open up agencies or develop products. We can become in love with our idea and not realize until we're pretty far into it that nobody else is in love with our idea. You've got to make sure that there is a market that has money and they see what you want to offer as important for their own well-being. And that requires some research. And what you said earlier, Tina, about don't quit your day job, I would recommend whenever possible, do as much of this in your off hours, part-time, weekends, end of your day as possible while maintaining your income until you're sure that your idea is successful or is going to be successful. Because one of the last things you ever want to do to yourself is what my husband and I did when we ran out of money and were facing bankruptcy. That's not a good plan. So if you are careful, you do your research, you stack all of the odds in your favor, then you can be off to a good start. There, she said it all, folks. Uh, that is such great advice. 
And I've known some people that wish they had taken that advice <laughs> um, when I've talked to them. But I do want to say that, you know what, being a nurse entrepreneur is very rewarding. Yes, there's risks, but there's also rewards. And so I like to keep our eyes on the prize. So I want to thank you for joining us today in the Nurse Shark Academy show. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Podbean or wherever you get your uh, podcasts. And don't forget to take advantage of the offers that we have um, in the show notes. I want to thank you, uh, Pat, for your time. You've been a wonderful guest. We could talk all night because I'm pretty sure you have many, many more stories. And um, if you had anything that you wanted to offer to our listeners, I'll give you a moment to go ahead and do that if you like. Well, you can go to LegalNurseBusiness.com and I've got a number of free reports if you are interested in that as a field of endeavors. And my other website is patire.com, spelled P-A-T-I-Y-E-R. I've got resources for you if you're interested in building up your writing skills, improving your proofreading and editing skills, or you're interested in exploring writing a book. So those are my two websites, legalnursebusiness.com or patire.com. All right. Well, thank you so much, Pat, for your time. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to the Nurse Shark Academy show. And always out there, nurses, if you're listening and you have a business and you want to be on the show, let us know. You can reach us at the Nurse Shark Academy biz. Bye bye for now. Attention nurses looking to take your nursing knowledge and turn it into a viable business. Ready to take action, but don't know where to start. Join the Nurse Shark Academy. We support nurses as business owners and leaders. We offer career and entrepreneurial coaching for nurses or other healthcare professionals. Whether you're a brand new nurse, a seasoned health professional, or building a startup, join a community of support. Entrepreneurship can be lonely, but it doesn't have to be. Our career and business coaching services are designed to help you achieve the life or balance you desire. Our experienced coaches will help you identify and attain your career and business goals, enabling you to become more successful in both your personal and professional life. I'm Tina Baxter. I founded the Nurse Shark Academy because I believe every nurse is a hero on his or her own epic journey. Nurses are launching new businesses every day. You don't have to do it alone. Join the Nurse Shark Academy and get the support, training, and coaching that you need to launch your successful nurse business. Become a member at the NurseSharkAcademy.biz. Thank you for listening to the Nurse Shark Academy show wherever you get your podcasts or watching us on YouTube. Don't forget to like and subscribe and don't forget to hit the notification bell so that you'll know when all of our episodes come out. If you want further information, you can contact us on the nurse shark academy.biz. <laughs>